well to its resting place for a moment. Maybe today, maybe this afternoon. We're going to hear from a few folks. So if we don't do it by this afternoon, it'll be tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Do you, you folks need to go through the whole bill? You just want to go through the corrections, the changes, rather. I thought the whole bill, but. I mean, at some point before we vote on it. What's your okay. timing? You have a half hour now. No. You've got. You guys have a half hour. Okay. Why don't we just Why don't we just go through the changes? Okay. Before we vote yeah. for it, we'll go through the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for the record, uh, Jim Damery, Lance Council, with Katie McLean, Office of Lance Council. Go. Uh, we're walking through uh, draft 8.4. Um, so, um, on the statement of purpose. Um, We've made some changes. So it says this bill proposes to realign uh, regulatory oversight by the Agency of Education and Agency of Human Services, a pre-K ed program. So the realign is a bit vague, and we can get more specific on that. Um, but the idea, of course, is that what you're doing now in this draft is you have um, you have dual regulation by AOE and AH, AH, AHS. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, early. Um, of public pre-K programs, uh, sorry, of, of, sorry uh, of private pre-K programs, you have sole regulation by AOE of public programs. Um, when it comes to monitoring um, those programs, therefore, you've got um, dual monitoring by both agencies of private programs, but only AOE is, is, is overseeing the monitoring of public programs. Keep that. Okay. Yep. So we'll, you'll see that as we go through, but uh, that's what the real line means uh, uh, there. So we're we're very specifically sort of unshackling the public programs from the dual. Correct. Correct. And pri the privates remain basically status quo. Okay. Uh, the public's, uh, and we have joint rulemaking still, right? Okay. Okay. And, and this also gives the other committee an opportunity to say. We've got this one. We want to take a look at that one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have well, should I say a uh, statement or ask a question? Ask a question. Okay, well, I, I, yeah. I want to change that, the uh, publication. You, you want, okay, so that's a really big thing right. we're talking about. Right. So, so I will hold that you want to, want okay. to change the publication. Yeah, okay. okay. Yep. Okay, and then a small change in line 11 to reference uh, simplify and clarify the program qualification criteria for pre-K providers. And then we've added a few more details here. Uh, require reports on the availability of qualified teachers for pre-K programs and how to ensure that students who attend out-of-district pre-K programs continue to receive uh, special education services. And five, create a grant program to fund regional pre-K coordinators. Okay. Um, then we go to um, the definition of pre-K child. Uh, so based upon AOE's recommendation, we have taken out of the exception for five-year-olds um, students on a 504 plan. So now you can attend pre-K and get the voucher if you're five years of age uh, but not yet enrolled in kindergarten, if the child is on, on, on an IEP program and the child's program team recommends that the child receive pre-K education services. So the 504 has been taken away from this exception. Um, pre-K education um, now is defined uh, as having the same meaning as defined in uh, section 11. So what's happening here is we've had dual definitions have been inconsistent. And in the previous draft, we aligned those two definitions <coughs> to be the same. This one, though, rather than having two definitions, cross-references so we don't get out of alignment going forward. That's the idea. Um, and we'll come back to that definition at the end, because it's been revised. Um, OK, so none of this stuff has changed. Um, I made one change here that the committee did not did not ask for, so um, to point that out. Number on line twelve, this is the notification by a school board uh, to 
private pre-K programs that the board intends on expanding or beginning a pre-K program. We heard that uh, open meeting law uh, requires the agenda to be posted two days before the meeting. So we have two days here, so I put one day, so at least um, you, know, you have some notice. Um, so they have to send them the link that they created, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. makes it easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but one day rather than two days before. Um, My mom's on the Vermont. Okay. okay. Then we go on. The next part is. Yeah, so except Kay cover this. Okay. Um, so if you remember, we had a conversation about um, where the qualified providers are going to be listed. Um, and sub the existing, um, not existing, but unchanged subdivision A um, talks about the Agency of Human Services posting private providers on their website. Subdivision B shows the Agency of Education posting public providers on their website. And then Subdivision C has been rewritten to read that Bright Futures, using the lists posted on the two respective websites, um, would post on its own website a list of both private and public providers that satisfy the program requirements. And it um, specifies on line six and seven, which shall be searchable by program type and geographic region. Okay. okay. Um, then we go forward. Um, so you see this, this language here, um, jointly developed, sorry, on line two and three, um, jointly developed and implemented by the agency of, Agencies of Education and Human Services. This refers to the uh, statewide rate that has to be established, and uh, they are doing that jointly, so we unstruck that language to keep it back in the uh, statute. Um, okay, um, so we are now in the section that deals with regulatory, I'm on line nine, regulatory oversight and rules. So this says, and it's unchanged, on line 10, the Agency of Education shall have sole regulatory oversight of a pre-K educational program offered by a public provider with the exceptions of uh, C C CFAP and, um, and STARS, uh, as we talked about before. That's unchanged. Now, though, it says uh, on page 12, the Department for Children and Families Child Development Division and the Agency of Education shall have a joint regulatory oversight of a pre-K educational program offered by a private provider. That's where you get into the, that change there. Um, and then it goes on, uh, on line four, unchanged, but just to point out that we've got joint rulemaking here still. Um, so line six, shall jointly develop and agree to rules. Um, so that's unchanged. Uh, and the rules pretty much are the same as they were before until we come to monitoring. Um, okay. Uh, so the monitoring section has changed because now we've got to deal with dual regulation on one side and sole regulation on the other side. So now it says uh, on line one, uh, they have to establish rules uh, to establish com comparable monitoring systems that are designed to promote optimal results for children that support the relevant population level outcomes set forth in the statute and to let, collect data that will inform future decisions by which the AOE and uh, DCF so jointly monitor and evaluate the implementation of publicly funded pre-K education programs offered by private programs. And the Agency of Education shall solely monitor and evaluate the implementation of publicly funded pre-K education programs offered by public programs. Okay. Just don't move on. Okay. Then, um, so again, it's AOE joint monitoring with private, sole mon AOE. Correct. That goes right along with that okay. bifurcation we talked about earlier. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of a little tricky corner in there, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Ye
<laughs> yeah, well, because of the wording, the publicly funded programs offered by private programs. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, just got hung up for a minute. Yeah. If we can clarify the language, we're happy to, but that's the yeah, intent. Um, okay, and then, um, then it says on line 8, which is unchanged, sorry, line 13, uh, that the agency and department should be required to jointly report the results of the monitoring. So, to suspect the fact that they might do something separately, they're jointly reporting. Uh, and then the requirements for monitoring on line 16 are unchanged. So, uh, same as before. Uh, okay. Um, then we come to, I put this in, because we didn't have a rule requirement uh, that said this. Uh, and it says that the rules have to establish a process to verify uh, that public and private providers satisfy and continue to satisfy the program quality, quality requirements, which are the STARS ratings or the teaching. So we didn't have it before, so I thought we should put that in. Okay, great. Uh, so that gets into the um, PS Gold. Um, gold as well, or that's just—that's not that's how the kids are doing. This is how the, the program is. This is just making sure that, that there are rules in place uh, for the agencies to um, have a process for verifying that these are actually qualified programs. That's all. Um, and then we go to. Um, Okay, this gets back into the definition of uh, pre-K child. So this is the definition we're in, sorry, uh, section three here on line five. We're amending section 11. Section 11 are the definitions used throughout Title 16. Um, so there's the definition already of pre-K education on line 10. Um, so all we're doing here is saying um, when we were in the section on pre-K, we cross-reference this section saying pre-K education means what this says. Um, and what this says is that uh, it means services designed to provide developmentally appropriate early, early development and learning experiences based on Vermont's early learning standards um, to pre-K children as defined in H29, which is a pre-K section we went through. So that's basically saying, uh, again, three, four-year-olds to five-year-olds if you um, are on IEP, right? So that's just again to make sure we don't have this issue going forward of having two sets of definitions that aren't aligned. Then on page eight, uh, line 18, we moved out the date for this, um, uh, uh, for the uh, secretary to develop uniform forms and processes. It had been over this summer. They want more time, so it's now March 15 of next year. Uh, but the idea here being after they do that, then all the school districts have to have time to use those uniform forms and processes for the next school year. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will give them more, enough time to, to do that. Um, then we come to... Um, okay, so we have section 7, you want to this one? Sure. Um, so this is the study that we've been looking at, looking at um, the availability of instructors um, moving forward. So the new language is that by December 15th of 2020, AHS and AOE are to um, study and report and submit that report to Education, Human Services, Health and Welfare. Um, first, their five and ten year vision for kindergarten. Secondly. Oh, pre-K. Um, That's my fault, but um, actually there might be two of these here. That's, so that probably should say pre-K, I believe. Yep. In subdivision two, the capacity of public pre-K for children four years of age. Pause there for a second. That's what I think, uh, I'm sure what you asked for, but should that be kindergarten? Because we've been talking about expanding kindergarten down to fourth grade. Yeah, yeah. So should this say kindergarten or pre-kindergarten? Kindergarten. Probably kindergarten. Kindergarten, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, could we say kindergarten for children that are four years old? Yeah, that's, that's what it looks like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 
Okay. It'll be like junior kindergarten. <laughs> okay. Junior okay. Kindergarten. So we'll clean it up. Okay. Okay. So you want it to read the capacity of public kindergarten for children four years of age. We'll just switch out those words. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And in subdivision three, bridging the gap between child care, early education, work supports, and parent education. It should be engaged. It should be parent engagement. I'm sorry. That's my fault. Okay. Yeah. Ah. That was my question. Yeah. I don't understand parent education. <laughs> okay. Engagement. That was my fault. Okay. This is late last night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going back and forth with language. Yeah. Okay. So that's <clears throat> so this report here, just to note, is by the two agencies, the report by December 15, 2020. The previous section has two agencies reporting on it for the same date of all the teacher qualifications. So but we don't want to, I don't want to at least combine this report here at seven yeah. without the teacher stuff. Because the two stuff is so specific. Right. So I want to muddy that water. So we have a separate report. Yeah. Same agency, same timing. Yeah, uh, thank you. On this. I'm sure that people are going to have some thoughts about that. <laughs> so. so. Um, and then we come to uh, <coughs> we come to the new grant program. So. Sorry. The part we just skipped over, I know that's new, but that's the special affordability study, basically. Yeah, that's not new. That's been there. Okay. That's the advisory group, uh, and they are uh, saying two things. Just to remind you, it's um, one is is how to ensure portability of special education services when the student goes out of district, and the second is how to ensure that the funding for for pre K is not doubled um, because of the census grant. Right. Can I? Can I ask? Yeah. yeah. If um, if a special ed student left the district, their district, their home district, and went to another school. Could the IEP and the funding follow them? Could. It could. Okay. Uh, it's not a parental, there's no, unless the parent takes a student away from the recommendation of the IEP team in the supervisory union, which is the LEA, then the, the, the FAP goes away. But that just doesn't mean that money can't follow. But it's a choice at that point, not a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so section nine. Um, just read through this. This is a new grant program uh, to encourage regions to hire pre-K coordinators. So it reads, A, um, creation of the pre-K pre coordinators grant program is created to enable SUs to work together in a sustained and targeted manner to retain pre-K coordinators on a regional basis. In recognition that supervisory unions or regions within the state they retain pre-K coordinators deliver pre-K educational services in a more effective and coordinated manner than those SUs or regions that do not have this resource. This program is designed to assist SUs that work in collaboration by providing funding to retain pre-K coordinators. Administration, the Agency of Education shall administer the grant program and shall determine the applicable, uh, the, sorry, the application and the work criteria Provided that applicants shall represent not less than three SUs that agree to work in collaboration to coordinate pre-K educational services to a pre-K coordinator who serves the region represented by these supervisor unions. The Agency of Education shall inform SUs of the availability of grants under this section and provide technical assistance to, to eligible applicants applying for these funds. The Agency of Education shall also advise SUs of other sources of funding that may be available uh, to advance the purpose of this section. Uh, program funding, uh, agencies shall award uh, grant funding under the program up to, uh, of up to, and it's a bracket, I'm not sure how much you want, per application to successful applicants. The amount of this funding shall be used, uh, shall be based on, on um, should say the applicant's uh, proposed budget and total availability of funds. And I'm not sure there should be a second year of funding, so that's a question mark for the committee to consider. And then D, on or before uh, December 15, 2021, the Agency of Education shall report to the General Assembly and the Governor on the impact of the grant program. The report should be made publicly available on the agency's website. And then notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, X amount is appropriated from the Education Fund to the agency for fiscal year 21, 
designated for program grants under this section. And then again, the agency shall include in a special request for the next year more money if you're doing a two year program, I was not sure. Um, and then the agency can't spend more than 2% of funds for technical assistance and not more than 2% of funds for the report. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, this um, grant program, we'll get a couple questions. Uh, uh, I'm on the, what we were just looking at here, page 28. Um, and uh, basically my question is the agency essentially will design this. They will make the rules around it. They'll say um, we're only providing 30% and you need to provide a 70% match. Or do we need to be... Prescribing some of them. Well, this is a call for matching funds, so I don't think they have the authority here to demand matching funds. Okay. Um, this, unlike the grant program for uh, um, literacy, yeah. which is very detailed, um, all they're doing here is, is retaining a coordinator. <laughs> so it's a much simpler program, I think, to administer than the other one. We have lots of goals that you want to see. Um, I was trying to think through um, sort of the same thing. So it, is the 150 intended to be salary and benefits for that person for one year? I think that they can use it in any way that they want to use it, just not to find how they use it. Well, the, but the purpose of the section is to retain, yeah. they didn't say employ or contract, but it says retain, mm -hmm. which is a more vague term, but somehow get the services of pre K coordinator for the, that region. Right. Um, hope is that what they're going to do is here's here's your seed money to get started yeah. and then you're going to realize this is such a good idea that you're going to start to put it in your budgets and you're going to be able to spread it out throughout supervisor units. Because what I'm, I was assuming that, um, so I'm thinking about the two-year thing because if you, just trying to think through the timing, if you, if this new person starts in September mm -hmm. and then budgets are due in January, you're not going to have time to show that person's impact <coughs> before you're trying to build them into the budget. So it's sort of like, we've got this great new person, she's working across, you know, she or he is working across three Just SUs. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're already trying to, you know, move that cost over to the SU's budgets when the person hasn't had a chance to show any impact yet. So I, that would be my case thought on that. And I, I don't know how to fix that, or, but just a two-year program would be, I, I think, preferable to give this person time to really make some changes. So add, add the option for a second year. Just money. Uh, yeah. would, would you like to do that? I need, I need some kind of physical... Well, I want to do that. <laughs> How many would like to do well, that? Well, I'll be having a counter-argument here. Okay, counter-argument. All right, so uh, I totally get what you're saying and, uh, and understand that. However, I think the model has existed long enough in other areas that um, uh, the argument is put it in the budget the next year um, is an argument that, that can be made. You know, it's, uh, I hear you saying, but it's really a superintendent school board that's got to sell the idea more so than that the coordinator has to prove how effective they are. And we do have a, we do have um, someone who recently walked into the room who actually started a program with 12 SUs, so we could maybe ask for how long that. Okay. Just hold that because we're going to want to talk about okay. this. Okay, because um, I, I think this is a great at some point how long it took you to get your 12 SUs going. Just, we'll just hold on that. I guess I, I feel like one year, I, this is the kind of program that really needs to be owned by the supervisory unions. Yeah. Um, that's why it's, I was asking about, you know, matching funds, because I believe there needs to be skin in the game. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm comfortable with one year. I suppose I can always come back and ask to have it be extended. Should we keep it for one year? Yeah. For now? Yeah. I work. Keep it for one year for yeah. now and go through and go back. Should we do matching funds? Well, I don't, we don't want. I think Jim made. I think there's room for matching funds. But the AOE right? describe it as they, they well, they can do it. They can do that. Yeah. They want to do that. Oh, they can do that. Okay. Yeah. They're going to design the grant. Program. And that's okay. what happened before. They were matching funds. There are organizations that would be very interested in.
<clears throat> is that what you said? No, it's the opposite of what I said. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. No, I think Jim, Jim said that they can't because we they can't require matching funds to do this. Yeah. I, I think if, unless we say it, we've, we've had language before that allows or requires matching funds yeah. for grants, it's been exp expressly a statute. Yeah. I don't know that the the agency would have authority to require matching funds unless you say it. No, I don't think we are talking about requiring matching funds, but it's possible for <coughs> SU to take in money from another organization. Yeah, and there's a language here about about having the OE help them find funding. Right. Um, that's here. Yeah. But requiring matching funds is not here. No. You could draft this to require it, or you could draft it to give the agency authority authority to do it. Right. Right. But if the agency said, okay, these are $30,000 grants, matching funds is assumed. In other words, they don't, they don't have to they fully fund. It, in other words, they, yeah. Don't, yeah. they don't need to, the agency isn't required to fully fund a position. They're required to fund the grant amount that they said that they would give. Yeah. Uh, and, and it may not be enough to, to fully fund something. Which well, it's going to be... The language, though, is up to a certain amount. So right now it's bracketed at 150000 but we base upon the budget that they actually come in with, right? So if they come in with a budget of 100000 they'll be 100000 under this language, I believe. And unless the agency comes up with rules that make it more of a competitive process, we may be... I'm sorry, per application. Yeah, yeah. It's $150,000 total. No, no. No, that's, no, that's a little bit. That's a... That's a, that's a yeah. <laughs> That's a uh, bracket because that was just the amount you had in your literacy bill. Oh. So yeah. it could be wherever you want. I don't know, 500,000? And how many regions are like? You think we're like what? 30,000? No, and the total yeah. matching funds, the total thing. Oh, this the total. Is a, yeah, this is 150. This you figure this is three SUs that are getting together. And that's basically 50,000 each. But that they're, well, no, well, yeah. you, know what I, you know what I'm trying to say. Yes, it would be 50,000 yeah. each, sort of. Which, yes, or if it was 12. Uh, right. Um, right. Yeah, How many regions again? Four? Uh, uh, three or more, right? Three. No, the region, the regional. Didn't you say there's like four regions? Is there no? Superintendents have, I think they have the, the four regions. Five. five. Jeff five. Francis, Vermont Superintendent Association, five regions. They have five. Oh. But that's not a state-defined region. Yeah. Just because of timing, I'm happy to <coughs> come back to this after we have time to think about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. General sense. Serena, do you want to hear from me? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, briefly, just to say you have a concern about this, we won't discuss it, but you're concerned. Okay, so this is my concern that I've been thinking about all weekend. I've heard from probably five superintendents. Yeah. Who one are really concerned about the uh, joint overseeing of uh, the, the pre-Ks. Yeah. Um, they find it confusing. They find um, policies being administered differently by different individuals. Not not out of you know just because it's so that's one. Was, yeah. So that's one. And um, you know what was really pointed out to me was the issue of equity and access, which I think is the foundation of the public school system. And a feeling that AOE should oversee the educational, <coughs> the education portion of pre-K for both private <coughs> and public. That's what this does. So everything you're concerned about this Just is right. Yeah. No. Yeah. The agency of education oversees it in private? Yeah. Yep. Along with? No, no. Along with AHS. No, without, I, we I don't want to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that way, that's made for the committee upstairs. Okay. Okay. Yep. And just I'll finish yeah. that. That the AHS be in charge of uh, safety and health for the privates. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so I, you know, I mean, we've, we've well, here, so come we've a got, long way. We've got a few, some time now to hear from. Um, we have the bees, as we call them affectionately, and um, let's go kids, LGK, to hear from. So thank you very you much. Welcome. We have yeah. two just to hold because they're going let's to, not, let's not do the next draft quite yet okay. Okay. on those little things. Okay. So we yeah. keep you from too much busy work. Okay, great. Um, but there may be some others, and we, we're going to need to fill in that bracket as well.
Yes, it is. <laughs> Extremely. Jay, are you speaking for the Yes. Okay. Did, you have to, did you happen to see what we added in section 7? You, you walked in just as it was uh, there. I heard what you said, but I haven't looked at anything else. So we'll give our testimony on 6.2 as we last okay. saw. Okay. So Jay Nichols, Vermont Principals Association. I'm here representing the organizations that are on the board behind me. This is joint testimony from us. Thanks for having us here today. <clears throat> on behalf of our organizations, we welcome the opportunity to testify. We want to really focus today on re-emphasizing our long-standing uh, standing calls for equity, quality, and simplicity in whatever pre-kindergarten delivery system model we have. And we want to provide feedback on draft 6.2, uh, 166. So first, so what, what, when, go, we'll go through. Let's do the check as to whether it was addressed or not. In, in you got. You guys can tell us if we addressed it. We've okay. got down below. We've got whether it was addressed by on 6.2, okay. the original 6.2 okay. that we saw. Uh, so, uh, as you know, creating and maintaining any effective system requires a willingness to make adjustments. One of our concerns has been since the enactment of the law in 2014, despite an, a memo from Secretary Holcomb and Secretary Gobey, respectively, of AOE and AHS at the time, in uh, 2017, I believe it was, there have been no adjustments made to the Act by the General Assembly. And there are persistent reports from the field of major concerns. I want to do a quote from Kate Rogers, AOE Early Education Manager. She provided the defini this definition on January 18th of 2020. What defines Vermont's universal pre-kindergarten education is the implementation of high quality, effective instruction by licensed educators who use evidence-based practices within intentionally designed early learning environments. We agree, agree with that wholeheartedly, as does all the research. The House Education Committee's recent phone conference with the National Institute for Early Education Research provided clear guidance. Vermont has focus on access, and we've received a lot of credit for that across the nation. It's now time to focus on quality. The research is compelling. The credentials of both the lead teacher and the assistant teacher affect child outcomes. And I'm going to take a drink because I'm battling a sore throat. <clears> throat> I know. I'm a lot better than I was three days ago. As we noted in our January 23rd testimony, the core principles that guide our recommendations, again, are equity, quality, and simplicity. By simplicity, we mean to take a complex law and make it as easily implementable as possible. So our main points are students with disabilities do not have equitable access to educational services when compared to their peers who do not have, dis who do not have disabilities. That's a huge equity issue for us. There's inconsistency in the requirement of direct teaching time for credentialed staff. That's an equity issue. There's insufficient child outcome data necessary to evaluate the system. That's a quality issue. And there are many challenges with the system's oversight and administration by the state. And that's the issue when we're talking about sim simplicity. That's what we're talking about. We do not support draft 6.2, previous to the one you just put up there, because we haven't seen that yet, as it does not make sufficient improvements to equity, quality, or simplicity in the pre-K delivery system. So here's our assessment, and again, you can question me on these. Question. If Chris, did you have a question? Can you sort of back up a smidgen? Yep. A little bit more, a little bit more. There we go. It says, the research is compelling credentials of both a lead teacher and assistant teacher uh, affect child outcomes. Yep. And then right below it, you say there is insufficient child outcome data necessary to evaluate the system. Right. There's national research about programs where you've had teachers teaching and the results that have come into play. In Vermont, we haven't tried that yet. We haven't looked at that. What we have in Vermont is two completely different systems, and we have no real assessment of how those systems are doing. That, that's the point we're trying to make. So how do we know there's a problem? We don't probably. We, we, don't, have any, we don't have the information to make any real judgment on it. What we have is nation, national data that shows that kids with quality teachers show great improvements in terms of kindergarten readiness, outcomes, how long, they're, how long they're, they, uh, their percentages towards graduation, those types of things. But we don't have Vermont data. That's our point. We need Vermont data. We need to look and see what the difference is between kids who are getting quality instruction and ki or kids who are getting licensed teacher instruction versus kids who may not be getting it. Thank you for that distinction. Yeah, I, I, I have to say there. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to do that. I'm not trying to rile anybody up today. Um, so for our, does that answer your question? Yeah, enough. 
Okay. Uh, so implementation goal is not met in 6.2. Consistency across the delivery systems uh, for settings and a licensed teacher qualifications and contact hours with kids. In draft 3.1, this was, re this was uh, addressed by requiring a licensed teacher to provide direct instruction during the pre-kindergarten hours funded by the school district. That is a fundamental thing that we believe has to be in any bill. It should be licensed teachers providing instruction if it's going to be using education funds to pay for it. Draft 6.2 moves away from this goal by omitting any reference to increasing direct licensed right. teacher con... So, and you know that what we do in this bill is we study that. We, yeah. we, we, we don't we don't have we don't have the data on it, yeah. so we start to get that data. Okay. Chris? That, yeah. No, not just yeah, we're going to get that. Right. And what we have is national data, like as I just said. Yeah. We don't have any state data. So we. Yeah. Is there the capacity to put a license? Like, no. if what you know, we came into millions of dollars. Is there the capacity to put a licensed pre-K early educator in every private? I don't, I don't know. Right, but that's I'm asking him. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. Know. I'm just saying quality needs to be attended to. We know, that the, we know that a teacher needs to be present. We don't know what present means. Okay. So well, we would say present it. means actually working yeah. with kids. Yeah. But the interpretation around the state is very interesting. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Uh, again, so research clearly demonstrates the importance of having a high-quality teacher providing instruction to pre kindergarten children. That's national research. And you folks all heard this in your conference call. And a qualified educator is what distinguishes pre-kindergarten pre education from early child care. So we want to make sure you recognize the difference between the two. We also have a goal of elimination of joint oversight. 3.1 addressed this, addressed this objective by establishing regulatory oversight by AOE for public providers and oversight by AHS for private providers. And then they would do annual reports together. We believe uh, that the advantages of bifurcating oversight with proper interagency coordination will prove better for both public schools through the AOE and private providers through AHS. Joint oversight has not worked well thus far. Um, there's no school leaders that will tell you that it works well. Draft 6.2 requires due oversight for the quality rating system. Monitoring quality and accountability, which we touched on a little bit. Draft 3.1. Address this by requiring program operators to notify the respective agency and school districts within five calendar days when it no longer satisfies one or more requirements. We think that was a good step. In draft 6.2, at uh, least the version that we've seen, it requires the Secretary of Education and the Commissioner of DCF to establish a process for remedial action. The language doesn't have any timelines, provides no requirements in terms of actionable responses to serious violations by AOE or, a or AHS. This is a special concern to us since it's been five years and we still have not seen an introduction to a pre-K monitoring system and that this new system that we're hearing about has not been introduced to the field as of yet. So, I think looked at 8.4. Okay. Remember, we haven't seen 8.4 yet. So you're saying you fix that? Maybe? According to me. No. We will look at it. <laughs> <laughs> we will look at it, Madam Chair. We will definitely look at it. Then we also felt there were some uh, implementation goals that were partially met in 6.2. We've got five minutes. Okay, special education portability uh, for providing a free and appropriate public education. So we, we support the inclusion of a special education study to examine the matter of equity. Uh, however, in, in draft 6.2, takes no immediate action to address the inequities experienced by students with disabilities and their families. This has been a five-year ongoing problem. We're, we're discriminating against our disabled students, and we continue to do that. We support an analysis, as we've said. And we also think uh, the analysis should include but not be limited to pre-K pupil waiting, census-based block grant, and the triple E grants. Uh, implementation goals met at 6.2 should be retained in any subsequent, 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 subsequent draft. Excuse me. Uh, the two years of pre-K eligibility, you made that much more clear. We think that that makes perfect sense. We agree with the removal of the three stars with a plan. Uh, moving to four stars as a minimum. We support any enhancement and quality requirements. We uh, Removing liability of public school systems for private provider actions. Uh, that language that removes the liability makes sense. That's a positive step as public schools should not be liable for actions of private providers for whom they have little, if any, oversight or authority over. In conclusion, while we appreciate the efforts the committee has made to improve Act 166, coined by it, version 6.2, we cannot support draft 6.2 because it does very little to address equity, quality, and simplicity, which would improve the quality of instruction and programming for pre-K children in the state of Vermont. 
and I've got a team here with me, and any of us can answer any questions you might have. I think it would be really helpful if maybe you guys could huddle while we're on the floor for it, and um, just look at 8.4. Okay. Okay. We have a different it, it looks like it looks like we're going to be on the floor for the rest of the day. I'm hoping that we'll be able to come Many of us have a meeting with the AOB at one o'clock, so from one to three, we're going to be tied up. What are we doing? We've got eight over on two stars. Um, so let's go ahead. And you have not, you're, you're not speaking to eight point four. Right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, got this sorted out this morning. <laughs> yes, I'm just kind of responding in the moment mm -hmm. to yeah. a number of things. So Sarah Kenny from Let's Grow Kids. Yeah. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to be back here. I'm going to be very brief um, because I find myself in the rather uncomfortable and entirely unexpected position of agreeing with the position of both the agencies, which is a new thing for me to say on this topic. Um, that the bifurcation that's proposed in the bill right now is not the best remedy to the situation we have now. That it's not a small tweak. It's actually a very major change to the system and that it's not advisable at this time when so much has been happening that the agencies have been doing together in terms of the monitoring system and the, right, the um, rules process that's underway. But I have already talked to you all about that, um, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Just a couple of um, thoughts that arose as you all just walked through the latest draft that I just wanted to flag. Um, on page eight of the new draft, where you're talking about Building Bright Futures being the one who administers a publicly available listing of all programs. I. <laughs> would, again, highly recommend that you all actually talk to Building Bright Futures um, mm -hmm. about their capacity to do that and what their work looks like. Um, it's very possible that that does make sense. I just don't, I don't think any of us can speak on their behalf. So, um, And on page 25, the new section 7, which is the report on sort of the vision from the agencies, um, the language that is in the bill, especially the third um, bullet, I think, I'm not looking at it right now, but um, talks about bridging the gap and work supports, and I don't actually know what any of that means. Um, so I would recommend adding some additional guidance to the agencies on what exactly it is that you're looking for them to report back on. Um, I do think that it is, it totally makes sense, and it is time to have an evaluation from both the agencies of this one under their current leadership about what do they see as the future for public pre-K, that that is a conversation that should be done in consultation with lots of stakeholders, including everybody in the room right now. Um, we would also, I think it would be um, really wonderful if that also included a parent survey of parents who are currently enrolled in, uh, whose kids are currently enrolled in universal pre-K across um, all the settings. Some, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it would be interesting to hear. I, I, what I've heard from you all and from lots of other stakeholders is that that data was not what you were looking for or not reliable somehow. So I think it would be great to, again, evaluate sort of what a, what a parent's thinking about, um, and especially um, parents with kids who are in the categories of children that we've been talking about, so students who don't seem to have equitable access right now, what would actually work for them? I think what that survey didn't get from parents was, does 10 hours a week work for you? Would you prefer more hours? What, what should the future, what, the, what should the future of the system? Well, I think we make a lot of assumptions about, you know, we know what that, that many working families need full, full day, full year care. Um, and so the question is, what would that, what would the best scenario look like for families? Do they need 20 hours a week? Do they need, you know, 50 hours a week? I think that's information that we haven't, that we don't have from the survey that was done. At least I haven't revisited it in a little while, but. Um, so I do think fleshing out that sort of the vision section for what the agency should be reporting back on would be really helpful to make sure that you all get the information that you're looking for and to ensure that other folks are engaged in that conversation as the report is developed too. And that's all, oh sorry, the U universal pre-K coordinators, I haven't honestly had a chance to really uh, ingest any of that language yet, so I would love an opportunity to have some other folks I work with look at it. So. So Section 7 is something that I worked um, with our lunch council to add uh, last night. And part of that came from uh, one of the reasons that I thought it would be a good idea to address 166 um, was to look at stabilizing what we have now for the present three, four, and five-year-old. Stabilizing that, but also keeping track of perhaps this isn't the model that we want and there's another direction to go. So. The, the intention that I held, which 
I'm the Technical Committee and see if this is a co-committee position, is to stabilize now and look to the future as to where we're going. And the thought of um, we get caught up in a struggle between public and private programs that I don't think is really anything that those of us, all of us in this room, really care about three and four year olds, uh, think is helpful. Mm -hmm. So are we, right now, this, this is a, this is a, a, public, educa a public education program, that's what 166 is, but it may not be meeting the needs of what we're, uh, else we're talking about, child care, job care, early education, parent engagement, um, workforce, all of those things. Is there another model, perhaps, that we're looking at going forward that we haven't considered that maybe puts four-year-olds in public school? Maybe. I don't know. It's going to be for someone else to decide. And maybe we need to be looking at our child care, um, you know, for, for infants mm -hmm. and three-year-olds, for three-year-olds, maybe we need to have a different model that doesn't get all tangled with the problems that we've gotten into this. I don't know what that future is, but I know that there are certainly smart people out there that probably mm -hmm. do. And having looked, I looked at what was happening around the states. Even though I had a nice weekend away, I of course had to go in and look at what's <laughs> happening around the states. And the governance structure around the states is different everywhere, mm -hmm. and everyone is dealing with this. And it's amazing. Some have everything in, in AOE, and some of them have a whole separate department, some have mixed, some have it all in their agency of human services. It's all mixed. So it's not like we are alone in struggling now. How <coughs> to Years ago, kindergarten, schools didn't have to do kindergarten. Who needed to send to kindergarten? Maybe we're at that question again. I don't know. But, and, and then I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> but to say, stabilize now and work towards the future. And if there's other language in this, I think when I look at, we're asking AOE to come back with this by December 15th, that might be a little ambitious. AOE and, and AHS to come back with that, that might be a little ambitious. But I think we do need to have a conversation about what our, our picture is mm -hmm. for our, our zero to grade three. Yeah, I, I think you raise an excellent point, yeah. Madam Chair, and I think the question is, is this study just looking at what the state does for four-year-olds, or three- no. and four-year-olds, or is it? Because the way this is structured right now, it's, yeah. it doesn't seem, uh, it, it's not clear to me that it's looking across the full, like, how do we support children prior to kindergarten yes. more globally? Yes, that's, um, that's the intention. So we're not looking at, I think you raise an excellent question about, we don't want to be looking at universal pre-kindergarten um, in a silo as completely separate from the rest of the supports that families rely on um, and the early care and education that every kid in Vermont deserves. So this was language from I the moment their family last, needs last it. night okay. and I'm really happy to, to talk. I'm also happy to say maybe we're out of time and that language gets discussed upstairs. I, I, I think that there are different, different things that, that we can do, but I think we do need to remember that we are in transition, stabilized now, and figure out what we're doing. I appreciate that, and I think that's yeah. some of the concern that we have with the bifurcation proposal is yeah. that it seems actually destabilizing as yeah. opposed to stabilizing, and I will yeah. belabor that one. So. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, with, I'm just wondering, yeah. I'm not saying yeah. this. Well, I just did a whole bunch of things, so go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> can we, um, if we send something upstairs, can we put strong, you know, that the committee strongly recommends something? We can say anything we want because we belong to us. And they can choose to change it, and then we can agree or not agree. So does it, will it come back to us? After that, it depends on how they structure it. Okay. Yeah. But we will, have, we will have a vote, a committee vote on what they do. Okay. And then we can amend what they do on the floor. There, there, that gets into a whole Okay. Just want to know yeah. what the uh, options yeah. are. So you said uh, bifurcation would be very destabilizing. I don't are think I said, I said we fear that, that it could be so, destabilizing as opposed right, to stabilizing. Are you referring to the uh, what we're calling now a realignment under 8.4, or are you referring to the full bifurcation under the previous version? Uh, 
I'm thinking about 6.2. I didn't see that that changed significantly in the draft you just looked at, where AOE is exclusive. AHS has basically no involvement with public school programs, right? right. right. Yeah. So that's the that's the answer. Where CC Baptist is. Yeah. Right. So tell me why that's destabilizing. I think it's one more really big change in the field. I think it will um, it'll feel different for folks out in the field. I think it will feel. Um, unfair for, for private providers. And I don't want to dive deeply into this conversation because I know you're anticipating that human services will talk about sort of the private providers impact on this. I feel like I've, I've said a lot about our concerns around the, the pace of change in the early childhood universe. Um, and the fact that the agencies have just finally gotten to a place where they have developed a joint monitoring system. They spent the last year reviewing rules and regulations, um, looking for duplication with a whole, you know, a couple dozen public schools engaging as a part of that process. I think we've just reached this place where the agencies are actually being proactive and thinking about how to solve problems together and to just sort of decouple all of that very quickly will be um, really problematic. That's a, I that's could have fear. heard that it was helpful. I think I would feel differently. What's that? If, if I had heard that the, having mm -hmm. AHS involved was helpful in the public schools, mm -hmm. I would probably feel differently. But I didn't. And I, you know, I just I would that. just add one thing. I, I I came into I got my license mm -hmm. um, late 70s, early 80s, I believe, right around the time that Public Law 94-142 came in, which was the new special ed, which was basically the basis of IDEA. Mm -hmm. At that time, we had a place called Brandon Training School. Brandon Training School was definitely the only place you should put children with developmental disabilities. That's the mm -hmm. only place that they could be served. It's in the institution where you had professionals. Mm -hmm. Well, we found out maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Right. Maybe there were other things that could happen. So they started to come out and we put them in special classrooms. And back in the day when I was there, they had signs over the door that mm -hmm. said TMR, EMR, and multiply handicapped. So that was trainably mentally retarded, educably mentally retarded, and multi handicapped. And they were in their separate rooms. And that was going to be the best thing we could do because that's the only way that you can make sure that these kids are getting served. Well, somehow, it took a long time, it took 25, 30 years to realize that they actually are doing really well in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And they're members of the classrooms. And they're not only learning in the classrooms, they're socially engaged. And, and they're teachers uh, of children without handicaps. So I just, I just, I guess I have more confidence in the public school's ability mm -hmm. to handle this than I think perhaps you do. I'm not saying that yeah. I don't think the public schools are able to handle this at all. Yeah. I, I think there are the Agency of Human Services, as we've discussed, brings a depth of expertise in terms of the um, early brain development, zero to five. I don't dispute that there are incredibly highly qualified, wonderful people working in both kinds of settings, across all settings. Um, and I think kids benefit from that level of expertise. We have said that we support a licensure, we support credentials for folks across the board, and we're not just talking about pre-kindergarten. We're working on many fronts to support development of credentials across, you know, from, from birth to five. Um, we do believe in the research that indicates that the, the credentials of the teacher and the training and professional development of the teacher in a classroom, whether you're talking about in a public education pre-K classroom or you're talking about in an infant room, the, the, that person's ability to have the professional preparation that supports them doing a great job is one of the most crucial things we can do in the settings across the board. Um, and the a Agency of Human Services also supports that and has been working really hard to support that across the, across the board. Um, so I do think that there is benefit to maintaining that vision. I also think that the, the, the concerns that the chair just raised related to um, what are the impacts of what we're doing in public schools and in um, pre-kindergarten, you know, public school pre-kindergarten programs, what are the impacts of that on the rest of the system and on uh, everything that families and children need um, is better considered with both agencies being engaged in that conversation together. So um, I, I agree with you. And that's part of, I mean, that's the big part of why the focus of our legislative work this year is not in this room, but is 
in the rest of the building and in this room talking about the supports that we need to be able to continue to increase the, the credentials and the level of quality in terms of what we're providing to kids birth through five all around the state. I just want to say that I think it's important to have an evidence-based conversation when we're talking about anything in this building and um, you know the research again focusing on what, what's best for kids for research and then again I'm not saying to overthrow but I think it can't just be people's you know, like, like you said at the at the Bradford School, Bradford School, Brandon, Brandon School, right? Um, it can't be that we just think that this is what's best. You know, what I think, and I think technology is at the point now that we can really focus in on what advances learning. So I'm just suggesting, you know, that we continue to look at evidence-based um, outcomes. As a, you know, and, and try to stay away from anecdotal or opinion or kind of that, and look at what actually, in data, says is the best um, program for all children. So that's all. Yeah. Okay, committee. In terms of this draft, are we going in the right direction? Going in the right direction. <coughs> 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 <coughs>